Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Talk Junkies, where today is going to be a very interesting day, as it is each and every single week here at Talk Junkies. If you're interested in last week's podcast, uh, I actually did one a few days ago with Pat Holland with the Missouri Freedom Initiative slash the Truth Money Freedom Podcast. Uh, we get into some very interesting topics <clears throat> when it came to that. We, we started off with the dollar and how that's doing. Um, then we get into Missouri politics and how Pat spent, you know, the past six months of his life as a, as a civilian in the grassroots, mov- grassroots movement. Um, trying to help get legislation passed in Missouri, the state that we live in, to help Missourians uh, in that aspect. Then we do a deep dive into depopulation in the World Economic Forum and how they have more ties to uh, local government than you think. So if that's of interest to you, definitely check uh, last week's podcast out with Pat. Pat, thanks for joining me. It was an awesome time. Uh, We have another great guest today. I'm very blessed to have this gentleman on. Uh, we've done many p- podcasts before. He's definitely an OG here at Talk Junkies, and he he spreads beautiful knowledge, very ancient wisdom, and if if that's what you want to call it, that's what I call it. Um, but he's currently writing a new book right now. We're not going to get into that. He's an author of multiple books. Howdy, Mikowski. How you doing, man? Thanks for joining. Yeah, it's been um, something like six or maybe eight months or something since the last time we talked. Yep. Right I think right it was just after it was just after Exit of the Cave came out, I guess. So yeah, it's probably been eight months. I'm I'm okay, like I say, just working I'm actually working on two books at the same time now. One is in editing stage, the other is just prepared and that's getting ready for hopefully so one's out in September, one's out in November. So that's kind of what I've been doing. Working hard. Rock on man. Uh, I'd love to one day try and uh dive into that realm, maybe write in a book or something. I know it requires a lot of attention and time, but it's definitely something that I'm interested in, especially trying to figure out what it is uh, that we're here on. Um, how'd the book do? How'd that Exiting Plato's Cave do? You sell quite a few copies? I, yeah, I think so. I think we we were around 4,000. Nice. For a, a little small author like me, I think that's more than I could ever probably ask for in a small period of time on a book that's, you know, that's a very narrow tight philosophical topic the books on philosophy which that is are not are not number one at the bookstores that's not what everybody goes raging for let me have another book especially one on on uh, you know telling me why the world might be created by an evil demiurge that's the book i want you know so um i'm pretty pleased with that and of course i was very pleased with the exposition book i was i've been very thankful with even though i've got of course a lot of attack for things and a lot of you know, challenges for putting this kind of information openly on the internet. I've had so many, um, so many really great people and so many great, and so much great encouragement over the last few years. Um, so I'm just, I'm again, I'm, I'm really appreciative for all the people who've taken time out to either uh, be involved in the work, be involved in the research, share what they're doing. And, and so thanks. Well, I thought what was really cool about that, Howdy, is the, um, you know, just you doing multiple interviews on the internet. Uh, a lot of people had you on YouTube doing uh, podcasts on their channels. Uh, and a lot of them, you may just a lot of great feedback, a lot of views. And I know that's not what it's all about is views, but man, it's so cool to see uh, so many people watching your content, man. Uh, and I know there was one podcast, Spiritual Awakening, I believe is his name. I can't, I can't remember if that's the one or not. Um, but you also, you also had people on who didn't necessarily believe with you and you had conversations with them as well. So that was really cool, man. That's what it's all about, in my opinion. Yeah. And again, it's, it's all about, I think for me, it's, it's, um, it's twofold that even though it's challenging material, I always like to tell people, you know, I don't know for sure. I don't have all the answers. I'm just sharing my research and what I have simply for other people's ability to for you to ask some questions, for you to have some discussion with yourself and other people and come up to your own conclusions. Uh, just my conclusions are really different than other people have had. So um, it makes it, I think, more, a little more important to share it because it's not the same as what you find everywhere else. But it's all just to get people to think. That's all. 100%. <clears throat> well, I remember it, it was shortly after I did the podcast with you. I think it was in December sometime. Uh, I went on a journey, man, like not, not necessarily a religious journey, but I did have um, a, a Christian pastor on the show shortly after. Then I had a, a gentleman right. who, who was, um, you know, not, I had a, a scholar on and we talked and he was like a scholar in like the New Old Testament. I can't remember which one. And he was kind of above me. Howdy. I, I mean, I, I wasn't quite ready for someone of that nature who had so much information when it came to the Bible. And then I had a gentleman come on the show. He wrote a book about um, the book of Enoch and kind of explaining that and, you know, he was more along the lines of it was mythology and it wasn't necessarily 
very much, very much truth in those books or in those canons. It's an Ethiopian canon, and it's not really looked at in the Western world. Um, so you, you got me to venture out, man, and talk to some religious people and ca- kind of try and understand mm. God, Jesus, and you know that type of realm. And you know, I just came out of it, man, and I, you know, I'm still more along the lines of, um, I, I'm not saying I hook, line, and sinker believe in what what it is you said. But I'm still very interested in that and not kind of pursuing the other altar. You know what I'm saying? Right. And we can get into it. I guess you've you got a couple of ideas of what you want to focus on first. But again, it's a reminder of really for me, it's um, it's looked, it's taking any subject that we've been told that this is the story, this is the truth, whether it's science, history, religion, anything, and just digging into it and saying, okay, how do we prove the narrative that we're presented? If it's history, how can we prove it? If it's science, how can we prove it? And generally, once you look into any of this stuff, the the story for the narrative falls apart. And um, then you have to start thinking about something else. So that's really what it's about. It's just it's it's seeing that it's not just trying to it's not just trying to get an answer to something. It's kind of stepping back and realizing everything we've been taught is on some level a lie. We have been lied to since like the moment we were almost con- like conceived, you know, even probably before we were born, we, we were lied to in the pre-birth state, right? We've been lied, 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 lied. And a big step to just figuring out what the hell's going on is just this acknowledgement of what can I find that is true? That's like, that's like really the journey. It, it, it's just, what can I find that's true? And it's harder than you think if you do it honestly. And I would say so even more, more set more now than ever because the internet's getting scrubbed of a lot of information. Um, just the, mm. the true bottom line information, you know, especially with Google or and even all the other search engines as well right now. I mean, it, just like, just for instance, this is just one specific example. Um, people have brought to light that in the Amish community, there's not very many um, kids with autism or kids with underlying autoimmune diseases or anything like that because they're unvaccinated. And if you do a Google search on that, you find nothing. It shows zero search results for the Amish community and what it is that they're dealing with. So that's a big movement right, right now. And I'm just I'm just saying that's one mm-hmm. example of you said how hard it is to find the true origins of certain types of history. And it's going to be more harder now than ever because of that. Yeah, but it's there. You just have to look. You just have to look. So where do you want to start? Yeah, man. So let's just kind of let's piggyback a little bit off of uh, just um, we riled up a lot of people with just the 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 NPC conversation. I know you got a new term for what that means or what it is. So kind of maybe uh, go down that road. Yeah, it is a hard subject to try to describe even um, because, of course, do we even suggest that, hey, the 8 billion people you see walking around might not be all 8 billion people. I mean, that that's that right away is challenging for the average person's, um, you know, belief field. Um, I was, I was of course lucky 25 years ago when I was doing, when I was doing all the heavy duty work on myself on the, on the self-observation work and testing reality that I, I, in my own way, I didn't understand what was going on, but I understood that there are certain people I'm running into that they're not people. I, I don't know what they are, but they, I mean, they look like me, you know, they, they operate like me. They have conversations like me. They, you know, they go to work and, but they're, they're not people. I, and so I knew, I knew there was something happening, but I didn't know what. And it's only been in, certainly I think in the last, in these last three years, people have, some people have started to notice that there's a really high mind that exists in a lot of the world's population that just a certain, it's like certain freak, a certain frequency just has to be sent out in the world. A certain idea just has to be sent out and 70% of the world's population just, they just go along with it. Like, and they don't even think about it. They don't ask about it. And if you do ask them about it, they, they just, they're just blank. They just, you know, why are you doing this? Well, they don't know. They just, that's what I was told to do. That's all until they do it. And I think that that opened the doorway to this conversation on a deeper level, this idea of an NPC, which in uh, you know computer game terminology is a non-player character. It's a, a thing that's in the game to populate the game to make more things happen than would just be one character walking in the woods. You know, you want to have interactions with other things and things to happen. So you have these other characters. They're not really, you know, they're not, they're, they're extras in a movie. That's kind of what you could describe it as. Now in our world, I'm not I'm not putting it at the same level. And so 
yeah, I, I tried to come up with a different word because I didn't like NPC. And the word I came up with was also not good. I think it was, I can't remember what it was now, but it was something like. Um, um, something about a vessel. It was a word that, yeah, it, it had a, it had a same name as something in Holland. And I can't remember what it was. But anyway, um, so I, I didn't actually come up with a new name for it. But the point was being that goes back to the what I see is like the creation of this realm and that there are certain divine sparks, things which are outside the matrix, um, things that are a, 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 a totality, a, a, a true light or a true power, a true energy, whatever you want to call it. And when this matrix was created, a number of these divine sparks, which are at least I can say me and a number of other people watching the show right now, we were all originally tricked into this simulation by demiurge archons demons there's a whole story of how we could have been tricked in some of the not some of the gnostic stories suggest that we were we were not necessarily even tricked to come in here we, like that's one story that the the demiurge of the devil came to like the heavenly realm and tr and tricked the divine sparks to come in by saying things like you know uh, promising temptations or promising power or promising importance and a whole bunch of divine sparks that oh i'd like to try that you know but another uh, another main story is that and I, I think this is the more likely, likely truthful story. Again, it's just a theory, right? Just a theory. But that when the demiurge created this simulation, that's what it is. It's it's a the demiurge. You can think of the demiurge as like an overriding AI. That's all it is. It's a giant AI, and then it's just it's built it's built a massive computer program. That's the best way to describe this place. And what when it got going, it didn't it didn't work. It it didn't have any life. It was a computer simulation it was it functioned but it had no life it had no had no energy and so rather than trick divine sparks in i think originally he or uh, he or she whatever this demiurge is this thing asked could some of you come and help me to get this thing alive and i think a number because at the base of everyone i know that i could say is a true human we have a desire to be helpful one way or another we have a, somebody, you know, hey, can you help me today? I've got to move my fridge to the other side. Can you? Yeah, of course I can come help you. You know, it's just that's natural. Yeah, we'll help somebody. They're asking for help. So it, that makes sense that our initial foray into this realm would have been to come and help this realm. And it sounds like at the beginning, it was it, this realm wasn't overly insane. The demiurge wasn't overly evil at the beginning. There was a, there were, you know, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not true creation. The demiurge was already was had some problems, but it wasn't. He wasn't evil, and we were coming in and going out and helping and going back and starting to get life into this system. At some point, though, what what nobody seems to understand is the creation itself. If you think of it like a, as a as a depth or a box or like a thing of quicksand, the bottom of that quicksand uh, was had like a virus example as it had a computer virus was sick and eventually the demiurge picked up this computer virus and in picking up the computer virus the demiurge became fully evil and in becoming fully evil one of the first things the demiurge decided was i can't let any of these divine sparks leave now because i can't verify that any any more if i let them leave i don't know if they'll come back and then my my creation's dead so i'm going to in a sense hold them hostage lock them in here because i did a video like three years ago and i asked the question is this a school is this a prison is this you know and eventually i came to the at least at that time idea i think maybe we're hostages that everything of the way is a hostage is kind of like being in prison but not really it's there's not really a school you you as a hostage you tend to feel you need outside help for whatever it is you're doing you know there's a whole lot of things about this idea of a hostage that actually made sense and now with this sort of Three years later, this understanding of more Gnostic Cathar um, um, or origin stories, that it sounds like what the if I had to make a guess, the demiurge then like shut the door and said, "You're not leaving now. You're here." And then created an an, an entire way of sinking us deeper and deeper into the simulation, so into the astral realm, into the etheric realm, finally into the depth of this. This, The material realm is the deepest part of the simulation, and it's the part that is the most sick. It was the part that was the most ill at the beginning. So we've actually wound up dropping ourselves, and you would say dropping our consciousness or awareness into the most sick part of 
the simulation. This all kind of makes sense for where we are. But there's not that many divine sparks. Like, you know, I've heard sources give numbers like 144,000. I'm thinking maybe 10, 20, 50 million at the most true divine sparks. Well, that's not much of a, of, a, of a giant world. That's not much of a simulation. So it makes sense. Like, well, let's pump out a whole bunch more, a whole bunch more for the simulation. And there's the thing. Sorry, I'm rambling here. No, you're I'll fine. To finish this this, this 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 presentation, and then you can ask questions or go because it kind of all fits together. So it seems like what the demiurge did first, um, first with the divine sparks, was create a soul. So when we talk about what's a soul, we always think of it as like the true us, which I don't think is actually true. The soul is like the bridge or the first, that's the first thing that brought us from divine spark into the into the simulated matter. In this case, of course, you know, some sort of mental astral realm, whatever. But it's 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 the initial thing. And it's important to regain the, the sort of the awareness back to the soul because it's then the step to the doorway out. But it's not truly us. Even if we make it to the soul, it's still not the. It's still not. The, there's still something even further back than what we really are. Our true power is even beyond the soul. But once you've got a soul for divine sparks, you can make a soul for and what we were calling NPCs. And so, um, some people got the idea when I was mentioning the NPC thing. They say, "Well, you're saying that they're soulless." Then, actually, no, they have a soul just like any other. Divine spark. There's, there's no. They look the same. They, they have a soul. They, they operate in the world. They, they think. They reason. They have, uh, you know, morals. The problem is because they're missing this divine spark part. This one little, this one little piece at the deepest part that isn't there. You might say there's a particular box of examination that's as, on anything that's as far as they can go. Because they can't actually reach the totality of themselves. They can't actually reach the divine. They can't actually totally reach the true God, whatever you want to call it, because they're made from the simulation, just like the archons, just like the demons. They're just they're just not evil necessarily. They're just they're just characters to populate a realm. And but in in, in every other is in every other aspect, they're exactly the same as a human with a divine spark. And you can't treat somebody even if you found out i think this person's an npc that doesn't in a sense from the standpoint of what's in the dream the thing that's here it doesn't make them any different than you at all we're all the same in a sense in the dream we're all characters in a movie we're all characters in a dream it's just they don't have this last particular part that could be filtering in and infiltrating our day-to-day -day reality. And so the conversation and the depth and the questioning and the philosophical seeking isn't there. And, that, and therefore, they become much easier because they were made directly from the dream. It's very easy, you might say, to be, um, in a sense, almost like have an antenna in their in their brain where – a thought from the computer itself can just go out. It's picked up by the by the antenna in the brain, and they just – that's what I'm supposed to think. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's my short overview of what you just asked me. Yeah. And, and that makes sense, man. And, I, and and you described it pretty well in the last podcast as well, but you definitely need to get in, into it a little bit deeper right there. And I, I think people forget how complex mm -hmm. that the, uh, this realm that we live in, how complex it is, and what you just described – how perfect they made <clears throat> the ma the matrix, if that's what we want to call it, how perfect they made it and how they were inserting other things into the matrix. And it's indistinguishable from reality. You know what I'm saying? At least our reality that, you know, like people are, people are commenting, wondering like, well, what, what, you know, if I were just to drop and kill one, you know, and I cut them up, what would be inside? I'm like, dude, that's not, that's not what we're talking about here. You know, that that's like, right. honestly, that's almost an NPC comment, right? So th th I just think people need to understand the complexity of the situation that we're in. Like you said earlier, right. kind of do a deep dive and research for yourself and you'll come to your own conclusions, especially spiritually or philosophically. But th what's crazy to me is that <clears throat> I'm, I'm curious and I, and I know you don't have a specific or a hundred percent answer is I, I I'm wondering how the Demiurge caught a virus or picked up a virus within the matrix because just real quick, howdy, I, I, I saw yeah. another interesting story where this gentleman was describing maybe what we're in is uh, a multitudes of matrices and because we all have the same question the origin question you know where where are we from what are we what are we here for and this gentleman suggested that there are thousands if not millions of matrices 
gathering data and, and compiling as much data as it can to find similarities in each simulation to where they can finally have the answer of why. And you know what I'm saying? And I thought that that was pretty deep. Mm -hmm. And I would, on, on some level, I would agree with that on some level. Anyone who thinks this is the only matrix in a giant simulation would be, you know, again, one of the great theories that get put out there is the reason for existence is God wants to have experiences, right? Well, if God wants to have experiences, why would this creature, this, this deity only make one of us and have one life as us? That's very, you know, we, we can say, you, know, you and I have had a lot of experiences in our life, but why wouldn't you have 10 million of us? Because then you would literally have every experience you and I could possibly have based on our genetics and our body type and our mental state and whatever else. And however, however we've been structured, we would have like, you know, trillions of experiences then. So it would make more and, and certainly my own, you know, I've had those experiences myself where, where I've had. I've delved into what I, I call them parallel lives, but I don't like to think of them because it could be it could be like a time loop. So you could just be, you know, you could just be it could just go to a point resets and you go back. It doesn't necessarily have to be this way. It could be this way. There's all sorts of ways you. But I, I don't doubt there's a million me's one way or another living a million different lives, and I've stepped in. You might say to the eyes of other me's to other experiences that I know are real. I know are genuine. I've had the experience, but not in this particular body, in this particular life. But another Howdy Mikoski has had that exact experience. And some of them are so, so to total, so real, so uh, so much energetic feeling in them that I don't understand. It, it sometimes takes me a while to, to, to how can I, how can I, did, how did I forget this? Like, like, how when I was 20, but I realized if I go back to 24 and I ask all the people that I knew then about this thing, they would say, I don't know what you're talking about. Because I realized it didn't happen in this matrix. So something like that makes sense. And then the other point you made, which I, I would agree to, data collection. That's a huge thing that's going on here. There's everything that's going on is being recorded. Every single way, every time a leaf turns this way or turns that way it's being recorded every time a fish turns left it's being recorded every thought we have is being recorded i mean literally every single thing is being with it's called the akashic records and they like to make it as some sort of wonderful godlike spiritual place it's just it's in our in our terms it's the cloud it's just a giant cloud of data that if you know how to access it you can access a whole lot of stuff and so well, why do they need to create such a massive data source? What 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 are they what are they looking to do? And it would make sense if you are either always looking to upgrade the simulation, improve the simulation, change the simulation, or if in some way the simulation, this all of these things together are being built to answer questions about a similar world that these simulations are built on. You know, it, it's an old uh, Zen story, right? Where Somebody asked the, the teacher, what is the world built on, Master? He said, oh, the back of a turtle. Ah, what is that What is that turtle resting on? Well, back of a turtle. But what is that? Don't you get it, kid? It's turtles all the way down. And it makes sense that we're literally on simulation layers upon layers upon layers upon layers. And, of course, we're about getting ready to go into another layer of the simulation. That's what's going on right now. They're, this one is shutting down and a new one's getting ready to start up. So all of this this talk, all of this discussion is is uh, I would call it extreme of extreme importance because we're I think we're literally in the switchover point to a new simulation. So digging that's why I think so much of this is coming up. So much of this is becoming available. So much of this is being talked about. So much more is able to be realized because it's like we're in this middle gap phase of the old one isn't done yet, but the new one hasn't started. We're in this kind of middle ground and so a whole lot of information can come up about what's the story of our reality so from that sense even though it's in, it's really insane to be alive now and it's probably gonna get more insane it's also a great time to be alive in the dream because how much information and knowledge is potentially available right now so how do you how do you tap into the matrix so i'm, I'm kind of curious because i I've, I've been trying to wonder that myself and i think I think that's a big part of why there's a spiritual warfare in that in that regard is because if people are more spiritual or more in tune with their with themselves or with whatever this vessel is, 
I think they have more likelihood to be able to understand that they are in a matrix and maybe even tap into it. So for instance, it was probably a couple of weeks ago, I was literally, I had just woken up, you know, and I think that's a really good way to induce lucid dreaming is like right when you wake up and then you go right back into dream state. Mm -hmm. And this was a, a brief, mm -hmm. a brief moment, howdy for me, where I was actually lucid dreaming okay. and I was aware that I was dreaming and it was very weird, man. I had felt like that I was, I was seeing this, it was like these weird objects. And then in, in my mind, I realized in, in my, at, at the time in that dream that I was like, man, this is like the matrix. And there, there were these, just these, I can't describe it like blobs and they were just moving and contorting in ways. It looked digital. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It looked like numbers, ones and zeros, and it was just moving around. And then I, it, then it started trying to talk to me and communicate with me. And in that moment, mm. in that moment it did. And then I was like, shit, I was like, I'm dreaming, you know? And then I, like I came out of it and I woke up, you but I was awake the whole time. But then I think my conscious realized that I was dreaming and communicating with whatever this was in my dream. It was wild, man. And in that moment, I remembered what it said to me. But then obviously I, I completely woke up and I had no idea what it had said. It was right. wild. It was wild, man. It was one of the most wild experiences I've ever had. So yeah. I, I guess my question and is, are you able to tap into the matrix? Is it via dream state or is it different for everyone or yeah, it'll be different for everyone. Everyone has their own sort of um, structure of how you will see through the, the the veil of the matrix or how you will see through the the, the covering. Um, <clears throat> like for me, it was the combination of reading Carlos Castaneda's books and what the Korean monk I was with and what the native medicine men I was with were having me do and the exercises I was doing with them and putting the two of them together. And um, so in my case, it was it was it was happening in, in a very awake kind of states, but reality would break down constantly in the midst of these exercises, like nothing was stable, nothing was transparent, nothing was solid. It was, you know, it could be here now and it could be gone. And, in a minute and it was it was that real it was that realization at least at that time i understood what these old texts meant by the world's a dream um and it made it much easier to to recognize simulate did i tell you the story about being on the street in in my mom's town the last time we talked or I, I think talked? was it a car accident or no that was with your girlfriend at the time or wife maybe not no that's that was that's yeah it's something else completely no this was um I was visiting my mother's town. This was in the midst of the uh, of this really intense work on on um, reality. And I was walking down the street, and I got this idea of like, is reality just being created in a sense because I'm here? Like, if I'm not on the street right now, would the street even exist? Like, is the street just is the street just existing because of me? You know, this kind of thinking. And I realized because, I, you know, I, I go to my mom's town a few off, a little off, but not too much. And there's there's a there are parts of it I've never been to. And I just said, OK. And I just turned left all of a sudden to a part of the, the town I would never walk to. So I just walked as quick as I could, like two blocks down, two blocks. And I hit a street I'd never been on before. I got to the street and I just stood there. It was just deserted. It's absolutely still empty. And I just stood there and I waited. I counted. When I got to 10, all the doors opened. People started coming out. Dogs started running on the street. Then people get in their cars. They're going. At, like literally, it was like the Truman Show happening in real life. And I'm just standing there watching this like, holy crap. What is this place? That's just I remember asking. I remember that was the question. What is this place? That like, because that... I couldn't see any other explanation for how does everybody come out of their house at that exact second in time if, in a sense, somehow reality wasn't manufacturing itself because I was now aware of it. So it, it, it's like you say, it's such a weird, complex, and of course, insane place. That's another part that a lot of people don't like to admit. They they want this to be a place that's a school. They want this to be a place that's love. They want this to be a place where the creator cares about them. They want this to be a place where they're always looked after. They want this to be a place where they'll always feel safe. And But the, the true experience for 97% of those of us that are here is this is a trauma machine. This is just a place of constant suffering on one level or another, not just necessarily physically, but highly psychological. I, just, I did a 
I did a, a long conversation because I'm on. I've moved over a lot to locals now. I have a locals channel now. Uh, sort of getting away from YouTube. It was getting a bit uh, challenging to deal with the comments and things on YouTube, and so I moved a lot to to locals. Um, and I did something there on the television show, The Good Place, which I think is a really good explanation of our reality actually and um yeah it's um and and when i write the new book in november it's going to be i'm going to take some of those ideas and expand it expand it in, in much more depth to kind of give an explanation of that this is that this is a place of suffering but a lot of the suffering that we go through is very minor it doesn't even really seem like suffering it's kind of small it's little tiny things but something that will bother us for weeks or months or years. You know, some of the biggest things, some of the biggest problems we've ever had in our lives, we get through them in a week or two, and then we kind of don't even remember them anymore. But a little tiny thing that somebody might have said to us at a grocery store, we're still thinking about that five years later. You know, it's still picking at us. And so this reality has so many bizarre hooks and layers and structures to it that it is – yeah, it can only be some type of computer-like simulation because there's no other way you could have this kind of complexity and this kind of intermingling of everything and with the awareness, like I just said, and consciousness of each one of us as we're interacting with it. This is like this is like a, a video game on steroids. <laughs> That's the only way to put it, man. That is literally the only way to put it. And I, I think we've kind of hit it on the nail, man, with uh, – Obviously, I mean, I, I feel like psychedelics played a different role as well. I think people are able to access the matrix via that way as well. Um, you know, I think, and I, I'm not advocating for psychedelics because, again, I think you can do it on a spiritual level, sober, you know, without without having to do that. But I think, like, with marijuana, yep. you know, it, it, I think, like, it, it makes you question things. It makes you have a deeper thought. And and I don't really even smoke that much, maybe a couple times a year. It's not something that I that I like to do every day. But it, it does put me in a deeper mind state to where I understand the complexity of what the matrix is, because there is one specific example, you know, one night I'd had maybe like five or six beers and then I had smoked a little bit of pot and how do I, I promise you, man, like the state that I was in, all the questions that were arising in my mind at the time, I was able to understand what you just described, the complexities, the different, just like the small nuances of life and why we think about those things. In that moment, that's those were the types of things I would that I was thinking about. I would think about one small thing, and then I would think about another problem in the world, and I would think about another problem in the world. And my wife's right next to me. She's like, "Paul, what are you talking about?" Because <laughs> I was I was just relaying all this information to her, and eventually I just fell asleep. But I think again, I'm not advocating for psychedelics, but I think that is a way to tap into the matrix a little bit, as opposed to just you know natural traditions. Yes, I mean I, I always have to put out these disclaimers that, you know, I was very lucky that right at the beginning of my work 25, 30 years ago, I was told right away, you know, everything you want to do, you do not need drugs to do any of it. None of the stuff I've done have ever had that in its, in its, um, as part of any of it at all. Um, I had a drug experience once actually without even knowing what I was doing. Uh, I ate something by accident that I, you know, that I didn't know had, had some stuff in it. So uh -huh. I'm glad I that was like 35 years ago or some 30 years ago. I'm glad I had the experience because at least I know what it's like. So if someone's describing it now, I know what it is. I certainly I was I was glad I had it because I knew I never want to do this again. This was long before, of course, I was studying reality, but I knew I I, I don't need to go through this again because the the thing I didn't like about it was that you give up control when when you're on one of these when you're on an experience with a drug, the drug is in control. And the drug will be in control until a certain point of time, as opposed to if you do these things, say, like as an example, with with some sort of, um, we'll call it shamanic dream like journeying. I hate the title. I hate the word, but it's a good just word so people know what I'm talking about. You can stop anytime you want. If you don't like the journey anymore, if you don't like what's going on, you just open your eyes and you're back, you know. Um, so I, I think that's really important that, that um, it's a combination of having control when you're having the experiences and the other that's challenging that people and who, who do do who have done a lot of drugs or or who are involved with alcohol or anything else they know because i was an alcoholic for a number of years right and there's um 
th it gives you something. There's a reason you go to it. Like there was a reason I was when I was drinking. There's a reason I was drinking. You know, it was actually giving me something, but it was demanding something from me um, for what it gave me. There was this, you know, it gives you this, but it demands that. And eventually I got to the point where I realized what the, for example, the alcohol was demanding from me was not worth what it was giving me. And that's why I stopped. And so that's, I'm just throwing that out for anybody who is thinking of exploring reality in this way. Um, you know, Paul's right. It, it can open doorways. It, it certainly can do some of that for you. But there's a whole lot of baggage, you might say, that comes with it. And you can you can do the same thing um, in very controlled practices. And I'll just leave it at that. And I, there's got to be books out there where people can learn those practices because how do you know how hard it is in the Western world to to have access to that type of thing, especially locally, you know, within your own city, just to have access to something like that. That's something you'll have to find on your own, seek it out and be very patient with it and try and understand it. And, you know, there's not very many shamans out here, if you know what I'm saying. So, and, and for me, no, I, but I mean, I mean, literally like you could look up uh, like shamanic dream journeying. Um, that's a really good example of, of something that could be done. And, and there's, you know, lots of books on it. It's they'll try to tell you it's how native Indians uh, do their, their otherworldly work. I mean, I, I'm thankful I spent time with native Indians. It's nothing like that at all. It's, it's some, you know, white anthropologists who took some of the things native did and packaged it in a new way, Michael Harner and a few others. And they, they created their own little system, but it does actually work. It does actually and certainly in, in early work and early practice, it's something that works really, really well. Um, uh, another one that I could highly recommend people is the practice of gazing, which is staring at an object for hours. It's, it's, and, and if you're going to try it, only start with a plant. Don't go more detailed than a plant because every time you go up, like you would go plants and then you would go trees and then you would go insects. And, you know, there's a there's a there's a specific progression that you use with the gazing practice. And you can't go if you if you go too quickly on the on the on the um, progression, you can get yourself in some trouble. So you, but just start with a plant and just stare at it for like 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And you will start to notice that things will start to change either about the plant or about yourself or about the reality or about anything. Just it, it's, it's simple, but it's, 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 it's incredibly powerful and it's something everybody can do. It's just, you would have to, you know, I, I when, when I was uh, 25 years ago, I bet you I gazed four to five hours a day, every day on something that was, that was just a part of gazing was a part of my day. Now there's a, a life review, a recapitulation, very, very, challenging and time consuming but anybody can do it anybody can review their life moment by moment going backwards in time to get an understanding of what really occurred in your experience so there's there are lots of these practices that exist it's just the real ones we call the real ones that'll take you somewhere are they demand your time and they demand your effort and they demand your energy and they're not necessarily easy and fun those are the things that sell out workshops and those are the things that make people a lot of money and those are the things you know if i was going to have a bunch of people over for the for the weekend say hey come on over i'm going to teach a recapitulation not many people are even going to do that you know and uh, and I, i'm not gonna I, you know and i couldn't i couldn't sit there like some people they have these thousand dollar weekend workshops and i'm like that's crazy so what could you even possibly teach that's worth a thousand dollars you know like it's just blows my mind uh, but as an example um so recapitulation i've probably taught a hundred people in the course of the last 20 years that practice the number of people who've actually started it i would say about 10 or 15 the number of people who came anywhere to even come close to completing it zero nobody and in fact in all the time i've been i've been uh in the last all the people i've talked to all the you know i've met one one that's actually done it i met another one that i would say did it 50 percent. and but it's something you could do i mean i did it i'm not the smartest guy in the world <laughs> by any means and you know it was just i made a decision i'm going to do this 
and I'm going to see it through to the end. And it's really challenging and it's boring. And at times I'm learning about myself. I'm learning things I wished I kind of didn't know, but that's what it's all about is learning who and what I really am and how I really acted with people and what I really did. And when I was, when I was a good person and when I wasn't, and you know, I'm learning all this stuff. It took me four and a half years and I did it. And then when I finished it, then I finally started realizing what it actually does, but you have to do it in order to figure out why you were doing it. So it's it's all there, Paul. It's just, yeah, who's who's interested to go seek this stuff out and and then put it into practice in their own life? Unfortunately, not many. And um, well, we we that's li- the way it is. We live in a very um, self. I mean, we we need grant or we need a self. I can't think of the word right now. Um, gratification, or I don't even know if that's right. We just need to be entertained in a, in a short amount of time as possible. We need to be entertained in, in every every single moment that we are, you know, awake during each day, and we just need those endorphins to keep going and going. And that's why you see this large push in TikTok, and you see people and their attention spans getting super short because they just want self gratification. And I, I think that's kind of a problem, and to a testament to what you just described is, look what what the earth or look what this realm has to offer us. And we're not even doing that because we're so consumed into Western media or Western society or even the culture. But what are your thoughts on uh, mediums? Um, Because in the United States, I had had an author on his books up here. I forget his name specifically, but, you know, he is I wouldn't necessarily say an expert in life after death, but he did. You know, I think he had a daughter that had passed away and he was trying to, you know, kind of dive dive deep into the medium realm. And he actually found out or he actually he's part of the, the Institute as well that actually um, you know, they'll, they'll give you, I don't, I don't know how they describe it, but where they, where they actually, they, they, they do a thorough research and they say, Hey, this person's a medium. They're legit. We passed them. They're good to go. There's only 20 of those in America or maybe even less like 12 to 20 that have been certified is the word that I'm looking for. So what are your thoughts on mediums? Do you think they have more access to the matrix? Maybe they practice some of these things that you're describing. Does, does anyone really have that type of access to where they can talk to dead, dead loved ones? A very rare few of the ones. I'm first to say that some some can do it. I mean, sure, it's a like anything, it's a skill, and moving into the astral realm is a skill. Maybe one percent can really do it. Um, I think maybe ten to fifteen percent are picking up some things, even though they don't really know how they're doing it. They like they're not really going and talking to dead people, but they're uh, similar to like someone like Darren Brown, right? The famous UK hypnotist. He can run these seances with people, and he, and he openly he, he'll tell people before, you know, I'm gonna I'm just, I'm tricking everybody. It's like you know I can't do this. I'm just a magician, and he'll go, but he'll he'll give them more detail about some dead relative than they could ever possibly know. And they come out after the thing like this is the greatest guy I've ever seen. And you know, Darren's like tells them later, like I, I, you know, I'm just I'm just cold reading. I'm just by the way you sit and the way you move and the way your eyes go and the way you cross your arms, I can tell a whole bunch um, from what your body's telling me, right? And and I think others. So I, I think I think there's also ways that that some people, some of these what you might call mediums, sort of tap in a bit to that world and come back. But here's the problem I have with the standard medium: the message from the medium is always the same. I'm talking to your dead grandma. She loves you. She cares about you. She's protecting you. She misses you. Oh, I'm talking to your dead whoever. Oh, yeah, they they love you. Oh, 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 you're asking a question about your lost, your lost, uh, what? Oh, no, no, no. She says, that's fine. Don't worry about it. It's always that. Never do we do. Never do we hear things like I'm talking to your uncle and he's telling me that he thinks you're a real bastard because you still owe him ten dollars <laughs> and he wants you to get that ten dollars out of your wallet right now and take it to whatever, whatever, and give it to his cousin because, you know, and, and until until you do that, he's going to he's going to be kicking your ass for the next like eternity. We don't ever hear that. And so because because there's only one view of the message, particularly the message that the person going to them wants to hear. They they go there to be soothed, right? They're not, you know, I, I don't, a few people maybe really want to go and truly hear what a loved one might say who's passed, but majority are, you know, they just want to be feel better. That's, unfortunately, that's the truth. And, the, and mediums one way or another, whether they're, like I guess I think some are truly fake. There's probably 20 to 30 
50% that are complete, truly fakes. You know, there's ways you can learn how to do that. Then there's another that I don't think are fake at all. I think they, they truly believe what they're doing. They're just, they know that there's a message that they're presenting and they're presenting it and they make everybody happy and that they feel like they're, they're doing their part that just the fact the person leaves feeling better is they, you know, they've done something and, and maybe they have, you know, maybe they have, um, but who's going into the other realm and saying things like, oh, yeah, I'm meeting with your I'm meeting with your dead grandma and she's telling me uh, that she's just been sucked in the reincarnation trap and she's been tricked <laughs> by these demonic beings and she's getting ready to be reincarnated back in here into a soldier in the next war. And she's you no, know, she's going to get her head blown off or, you know, whatever. Like, you know, hey, by the way, don't go to the white light. These things are going to try to screw with you. If you see if somebody tries to tell you it's me, it's not. It's an archon. You know, why don't we hear stuff like that? Like. Either everything I come to say and all of these other the Gnostics and the ancient Egyptians that were, that were all full of shit, that were all completely wrong, theoretically, possible, of course, or maybe all of that information is not getting through because, you know, it's not getting through at all. Now, here's the thing anyway. So it's a good question because, you know, I, I, have, a, I have someone in my life who was murdered. Uh, an ex-girlfriend who was murdered 30 years ago. And for a while, when I learned how to journey, uh, once a year, I would go and visit her. I thought I would, that's what I say, I would visit her in the after death realm. And it was very, she was very wise. She, that, that she was lots of information I was getting, et cetera. But after some time, I had to step back and, and start saying, okay, am I really talking to this ex-girlfriend in the after death world? Is that really what's going on? Or am I having a conversation with myself with an image of who and what I remember this person to be and who and what sort of parameters. Because that's another thing. If you watch mediums, they, they will tend to – this is another interesting maybe theory of what's going on. Is their tap – they're not really talking to a dead person. Like let's say you come to me and I'm the medium and you say, I wanted to talk to my dead uh, uncle. Well, I'm not really talking to your dead uncle. What I'm, what I'm somehow tapping into is your – your memory in your in your consciousness and in your in your energy field of your memory of the uncle of your view of the uncle and so i'm presenting you in a sense even though i don't know that's what's going on i've tapped into you and your memory so in a sense i can be giving you oh yeah i've seen this person he's this tall he's wearing this kind of suit jacket yeah that is he always wore that jacket you know it's like rarely somebody would come and say oh yeah, i'm talking to your uncle and he's wearing a pair of shorts and he's got flip flops on my uncle never wore shorts and he never wore flip flops, but that would make sense if you're really tapping into the memory of a, because if somebody's in the astral realm, they don't need to look anything like they did on earth. They don't need to do anything like they, you know, they, they could literally, you know, if they want to be like Steve Martin and put like a fake arrow through their head and walk around, why wouldn't you do that in the astral realm? Right. So that's another possibility of what's going on. So again, it's not, they're not being totally dishonest then. They are tapping into something energetically. They are sharing information. It's just possibly it's the very same information that you already have. You know, it's like I'm trying to find the lost key. And on some subconscious level, you know where the key is. They're tapping into your energy field. I think the lost key is in this, in this, uh, your grandmother says it's in this box by your, by your bed. Oh, the box by my bed. I never checked that place. But on subconscious level, you put the key in the box. You know that's where it is. It's just never become conscious. The person who's the medium is actually tapping into the information you need, just not the way they say they're doing it. Sorry, that's a long answer. No, but no, there's, no. It's, again, just things to maybe think about around this field. But, again, I will leave it that every once in a while I have bumped into somebody that I think might truly be genuine because when I've watched them work, I can see – they're talking to the person that you know who, who they're asking the questions to, and I can see they are. What's the word I'm looking for? They're editing a lot. They're getting you know 20, 20 pieces of information, and they're thinking I can only share two um, because the other stuff is just too intense for this person to handle. They're just you know, and they're literally editing out. And I've asked them before. I, yeah, I'm just I can't tell them any of this stuff because they just they it would just drive them insane. So uh, I think there's a few though that are truly genuine. Yes. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, and there's well, something I would definitely want to get into before, but, but, but before this, just kind of just st this topic is striking me. And the reason I say that is because I, I'm terrible with some of the guests that have came on before trying to remember their names. But this was a, a UK gentleman. He's pretty well known for communicating with 
um, otherworldly beings, entities, whatever you want to call it. But uh, there was a guy that he practiced. It was some type of like dream work yoga or something, some type of deep meditation yoga. And it's going to piss me off that I can't remember his name. Sorry. But he had a mentor and this guy was very popular in the 50s and 60s and he was a doctor. And allegedly he could, in a trance state, basically he would turn in, he would let the, the entity take over his body, the alien or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And, and allegedly it was mm-hmm. like, um, like star, like Jesus or Genghis Khan or, you know, very important figures. He said he could still communicate with, and he would speak as those, mm-hmm. pe- those people would take over his, his soul or his body and speak at, speak out of him. And a lot, and I forget his name, but a lot of people said it was very interesting or, or you know, I don't know how much truth there is to that, but. That it could be I just think fairy there's tale. way more see, see, that's that's different than a medium right that's more exactly. like a channeler exactly the ch- channeler is actually acknowledging that something is taking them over and speaking through them um again i was really lucky at the beginning of my work i had a an african gentleman who was uh, teaching me a bit and he just said uh, just a reminder if uh if a really high level spirit has a message for you they'll just come and you know they'll tell you they'll just it'll they'll just they can they'll manifest into the realm or they'll they'll send the message in the realm to actually have to go into another into a physical into someone's physical body requires such a drop of their vibrational rate that they would literally burn up only very low level beings can make that jump so we said be very careful of anything you take that doesn't mean everything would uh, just like the medium doesn't mean everything would be not true it just means there there would be a lot of extreme testing you would have to do before you could verify this is a safe piece of information for me to take for sure uh, and that's kind of what i gathered it's, it's see it, you got to think about these things thoroughly and try and understand each you know each moving part that goes to it but why why is there the- again i mean i mean look how i, I was so lucky like i mean i I think of where I am now and I, I've it's been 30 years and I, I went through a long period of, you know, where nobody would talk to me and says, no one knew who I was. No one would buy any of my books. You know, it wasn't until three or four years ago I would ever, could ever do something like this. No one would care. Um, and I wondered if I would ever have, if I would ever share all this stuff. And I wondered, did I, what did I do any of this for any reason at all? Uh, of course, now I'm very thankful where things are and that I have this opportunity to, share my story and what I've come to see. But I was so lucky at the beginning that one of the first days with this African gentleman, he took me to a new age bookstore in our, in, in where I lived in Calgary. And there was a giant bulletin board, you know, of all of the, at that time, that was the the height of the sort of new agey workshops and, and, and lectures and whatever. Right. And so this board is plastered with stuff happening in the next month. And he just told me, he said, if anybody's got real wisdom, they're not going to be on a board like this. And if by chance they ever are, it's only going to cost you like a dollar or two to have to go and see him. And it was like the one of the greatest gifts of information I ever got because right from the beginning, I was able to steer away from a whole lot of stuff that I could have been attracted to. It looked nice. It was shiny. It was interesting. It was exciting. And then I realized, no, the ones with the wisdom they won't be doing that. They'll be doing something else. And then in the course of time, that's how I was able to meet the the Korean monk and how to meet the native medicine people. And, you know, they're, <clears throat> they, no one would know about any of them. And you had to sort of bump into them almost by accident or ask a whole lot of people. One of the medicine men that I met in 2001 or 2002 or whatever it was, I made like, I don't know, seven or eight phone calls to different people on the reserve and they would send me to somebody else and they would send me to somebody else. And I just, I just didn't give up. And eventually finally said, I think I know we should talk to. And they finally, he doesn't have a phone. You have to go to this, you have to drive to this guy's house to explain to me how to get there, which is not easy to do on a native reserve when you haven't been to one on that particular reserve. And it was hard to find it, but I eventually found it. And um, yeah, again, grateful, but they, they they do exist out there. The the people with real knowledge and real ancient uh, ancient understandings they exist out there. They just you have to do some work if you're going to find them. Almost like gatekeepers, man. That's very matrixy. Just just thinking about what you just described, and I think about that in everyday life. I'm just like, man, there 
there are definitely places or people that I would want to meet that I'll probably never will unless I do exactly what you just described and that's seek it out and, and don't take no for an answer. Right. So, and when I went to this guy's house, which was even more interesting when I actually went to his house, um, he invited me in. I, I told him why I was there and he invited me in. I sat down in a chair. He didn't offer me anything. He didn't offer me a glass of water. He didn't offer me like something to drink. And he just went about his day. He was just doing his stuff. He was doing whatever he had to do. He's mixing some plants. He's making some phone calls. Somebody comes over and talks to him. And I was just sitting there. And I was wondering, like, first, does he hate me? Does he hate that I'm being here? Should I should I just leave? And well, he hasn't told me to leave. If he wants me to leave his house, he would tell me to leave. So I just sat there for like eight hours. I decided I'm going to sit here until he tells me to leave. Kind of, you know, I just, I just sat there and by around five or six o'clock, he finally just turned to me and said, okay, come back tomorrow morning. And I came back tomorrow morning and they started talking to me. So he was just testing. Could I just sit there and be still and just have patience and wait? So it's interesting also how, how they operate in a totally different time and manner than we think they do. That's powerful, man. That's so powerful. It, yeah. And it, I don't know. I, I kind of want to, I don't know if those are deep roots or whatever you want to call it, because I've, I've been here in this realm for 34 years and all I know is Western culture and, and I have dabbled and tried to understand other cultures. Not really. I'm just saying that vaguely, but I just hate the rush of this life, you know, in the Western world, everything's so fast, everything's moving so quick, man. And I, I just, having three kids, like I had to slow it down. I had to step down from a GM mm -hmm. position at a restaurant and just work as a bartender for 30 hours a week, because now that allows me to watch my kids develop and be who it is that they're going to be. And, you know, and, and just the more, at least the past couple of weeks, man, I just, the more I just even want to slow it down even more and enjoy each moment and understand how hard life is and not, and it's not easy. And, things take steps like just for, mm. for cooking, for instance, like everyone wants to cook like the best food and they want it as quick as possible. There is a process to make delicious, beautiful food. It takes time. You know what I'm saying? I just, I've been so impatient yep. my whole life. Howdy, I guess is what I'm saying. And just you describing that situation that you were in where you literally just sat in the guy's room for eight hours. Dude, that's awesome, man. And I think that's what we need more of is just people to slow things down. But, um, yes. Um, and, and really our world, you were talking about our world is, you know, people are seeking entertainment. What the realm is doing to us is they want distraction. They want us distracted from just that being still going within, asking questions, looking for ourselves. And they don't care if the distraction is entertainment, if it's enjoyable, if it's, if it's difficult, it doesn't, they want the, they want the focus out there. They don't want the focus here. And technically, our whole technological society now, our whole screen-based society is a really a giant distraction. I mean, I've had to like, I've had to like watch myself, like maybe I, I oh, I think I, like I don't watch much on YouTube anymore, but let's say, okay, I haven't seen this person. I'm going to see what they've got to say. Curious. Do you notice then you watch a bit of the video? Maybe you don't finish it. You watch a bit of it. Okay. That's what you went there for. But then, oh, they have all those videos on the side of the screen. Oh, suggested possibility. Oh, well, yeah, this guy looks interesting. And then all of a sudden you watch a bit of that. And then, well, you know, and all of a sudden it's like, it's been an hour and 20 minutes. What the hell have I been doing? <laughs> you know, how did I just get drawn in to this? And it's another example of just how this thing is set up to distract us somehow that way, as opposed to, like you say, just here so i i recommend like it helps me in my life that i have a garden now a giant i'm you know we're trying to grow uh, at least a, a small amount of being self-sufficient uh, of our own of our own food but it takes it takes work of going out and weeding and hoeing potatoes and plant uh, healing potatoes and watering and checking and you know and but that's a, it's like a grounding mechanism because now i'm like i'm into the earth i've slowed down i have to go on a different pace because i'm at the pace of the plants or just go into nature and sit on a rock for a while and just stare at the at a tree or the, the lake or something and just it's it's like and i i get it that the average person's life the way it's been structured now is intense 
And yeah, somebody's got a couple of kids and one's in soccer, one's in dance class, and they've got to finish their job and then get one to soccer, one over here, one do this. It's like, where do you actually find time to be still? And that's a part of this whole society. I was just, I was having a talk with my wife a little while ago. We were talking about the differences of how ancient societies, particularly tribal societies were structured. And it's the biggest difference is how they, how they looked after children. Like the the parents were not the main teachers of children for the for the main part of their life. That was the grandparents' job. Like the 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 adults were still they had chores to do in the course of the day. You know they still had hunting to do and water gathering and and things to make. And the grandparents, who now should have even more wisdom from having raised their own kids and learned from that, they can raise the grandchildren differently. And they were the ones who were, who were mainly in charge of the children, as opposed to our society where somebody hits 60, let's get them the hell out of here. Let's stuff them in this home. Let's get rid of them. And we pretend to go see them once a month and pretend like it's interesting. But, you know, as opposed to in these ancient societies where it's like now once you become an elder, you have value. You have importance, you have knowledge, and you have the ability to help raise children so that the adults can go and do the things they have to do and not have that as an extra, an extra burden on their day-to-day -day life until the child gets to a certain age and then, you know, change over. Imagine how different life would be, like you say, like with, with your with with your your children, if you had if that was just in the culture, if that was just the way that it was, automatically your stress level would go down, automatically your your interaction with the world would change, but we've been set up in such a way, like I say, to make a giant energetic distraction and to keep us running on a mouse wheel for no reason as to why we're doing it. Uh, it's 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 it just every way every way you look at this reality and particularly society, what you call human society, it's insane. Every well, every part of it is insane, and yet people just keep getting on the wheel and doing it. And it's so it just perpetuates itself. Well, I, I, and I think you said it last time, man. It's the lu the the luge or whatever the soul the the energy sucking the luge or whatever it is. I think that that might be the reason. But so I, I guess that's I and mean, we'll kind of leave it here at this because I know we, we're I think we're close to the hour. My phone's upstairs. I have no idea how long we've been talking, but um, we're probably close to an hour. But this is probably yeah. a good way to end it. Is why do you think that the major? Well, you had a you had another question, and we probably should get. That that's a decent question to get to as well for this show if you'd like to get into it. But just Which, go go wherever you want. It's okay. We can go another twenty minutes, fifteen minutes, or something. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I forget what that question was. Which which one do you want to talk about first? Well, you had one in your mind, but you also had this one about uh, about uh, something about history in the eighteen hundreds and. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, so uh, th I think this kind of coincides with it. Explosions. So so. We, okay. Whenever you look and you find the information that, you, and you, like you said, it's very hard to find, and I can concur with that. That I think that's extremely true. What it is in our past, and whether or not there have been cataclysms in the past, or whether or not there have been matrix, uh, matrix shifting into a, a higher type of matrix. Why? What do you see in the breakdown right now of the matrix? Why do you think it's breaking down right now, and that we are shifting to go into a new matrix? Because. I guess my question is, why would the matrix allow us to see flaws within it? You know, like with all this new information coming out, like you said, it's almost like a golden era. It's a bad time to live in, but it's also a good time to live in. Why do you think that the matrix is allowing or the demiurge is allowing this information to come to light? And why is it breaking down and shifting into a new one? Yeah, I don't necessarily say it's allowing. I think the stuff is always there. I think that in the, what you call glitches in the matrix are always, you know, the matrix isn't perfect. <clears throat> there's there's lots of stuff there that can be seen through any time but it's it's pretty clear that whatever simulation we're in has been restarted at least once probably several times in the course of our history there are and it becomes a giant question of <clears throat> when did the simulation start the simulation that we know now we like to think it's goes back billions of years or hundreds of millions of years and well maybe things have been tinkered around and maybe things have been changed slightly and but you know maybe not it could have just started may the 1st 1938 for example everything before 1938 is doesn't exist actually it's just backstory of a westworld robot or maybe it all started on um july 27 
1994. How about that? It actually started in the middle of our life, for example. That literally the first number of years of our life didn't really exist. These are all questions to have to contemplate because a Westworld robot does not know that their backstory is not real, that it's backstory. They are very clear that, that that's their story, that's their history, that's their past, right? So we have this, we have that first question of, well, if it's a simulation, which pretty much seems to be, when did the simulation start? And when and I, I I get I'm pretty sure that it's gone through multiple shifts, multiple changes, and that relates to the louche. As this as the simulation grows, because the simulation doesn't can't stay stable. It's like anything, it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Another glitch is found. So we have to add more code here, more of this. We have to fix that. And it just naturally it grows. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Or they need more and more data. Or, and as it grows, it needs more power. It needs more louche. Louche is really power, energy power to run the system. They've just devised it to come from us. We, we are the louche creators to keep the whole matrix running. So I think there comes a time when something in the system says we're running out of power. We're not getting enough. We need to make we need to get a new simulation started that generates more power. And it makes sense that that's where we are at, because what's again, what's what's the. How to say it, as I see it now, what's going on in our world, what these sort of world, I hate calling them controllers. That's a crappy word because they don't control anything. Um, influencers they influence people to think a certain way by that they know what they're talking about right that we should listen to them because they have a government position or whatever um that everything they're setting up which is a, a transhumanistic agenda which is a human becoming like a robot in many ways shape or form that only makes sense if you're moving into a different simulation that Again, like I don't know if I said last time, but if I'm here and the system is here and it's drawing energy from me, there's energy automatically lost in the in the in the transfer. There's space there, so something will get lost. But if they could put me and the system uh, together, there's no energy loss. So they wouldn't actually need to put any more things in the system to generate power. You just need to have a better way of a, with uh, with not not losing what's naturally there, just sucking all of it. You might say. So that would make sense as to what they're doing. And they're not they're not doing all of this for us and what's coming in the future here. They're doing this to prepare all of us and get the the uh, the human construct, I guess you might say, ready for the next simulation. And at some point in time, this one's going to be the other one's going to be switched on and this one's going to be switched off. And there will be like an even bigger gap between the one off and the one on. And in that gap space, which I think happened many times in our past, is like then the doorway home is just wide open. And anyone who is clear and knows what they're looking for and knows what's going on and has the intention of, I'm not interested in being in this anymore, certainly not in some other transhumanistic simulation. Just I'm, I'm leaving. The doorway will be open. And I don't think it's that long. You know, 2030 is a, is a date that's thrown around a lot in a lot of different places. I think that's a distraction. I think the year's, the year's going to be much closer than that. Remember two factors about the year 2025. One is that's the year that Deagle uh, military information came out. You know about that, right? Uh, I can't say that I do or I don't. It was it, back in 2018. It's a it's like a military contracting site, and they put out population estimates for the world for 2025. And almost every Western country was down like 60 percent in population. The rest of the world was about equal, but like 60 70 percent of Western countries' population was gone, was decreased. Uh, of course, that was scrubbed from the internet about a year later. I made screenshots immediately because I know this is not going to last long. Uh, people have tracked it down through the Wayback Machine, but it's not the it's not the exact original page that I have screenshotted. But it's it's something that's close. The numbers are close, so you can still find it. Um, Deagle.com is the place, and Wayback Machine and track it down. Um, so that's but that's that the the date they gave for that was 2025. They tried to they tried to say on the website itself that it was to do with immigration patterns or migration, different migration patterns. But 
like why would the United States go from 300 and some million to 70 million because of migration patterns that doesn't something else is going on 2025 is also the year in the movie they live that when Rowdy Roddy Piper and his friend Frank are in the big meeting in the underground chamber and they're announcing that we have finally defeated human resistance and the aliens are we, we aliens have won they say the year is 2025 Oh, wow. And so to me, 2025 is, is a, is, is a really important year. I've heard someone else come out, came out a few years ago, maybe five or six years ago and said, whoever got this Mayan calendar 2012 thing, that was wrong. They were off by 12 years. The real year is 2024. So all of that begins to fit in and, and we are going, this world that we exist, that we experience is going so insane, so fast i mean like every day if i go look at some stuff on some various websites or some alternative news sites it's just nuts like 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 it's like the the stuff is nuttier than happened like the day before and it's just it, it's just mind-bending how crazy the place is becoming and to me it only makes sense that we're we're, we're hitting the end of the simulation and so the craziness is is to prepare those to, to again, it will be a trick, and there'll be different tricks for different different tricks for different folks to get them into the next simulation. But I, I'm talking now about this stuff because maybe there's a few others like me who have got to the point where you can say, I'm just not interested in this place anymore. I just, I don't, you know, I don't need to leave right now, this second, you know, but. Um, I'm just not com- going to come back into this when it's finally my time to go. I'm prepared and I'm just, I'm heading home. And, um, and maybe there's a few others that have that, have that feeling yourself. And I think that's what, that's really what a lot of this time on, in a physical body is, can be for is preparing oneself for that journey, preparing oneself. Carlos Castaneda called it right. The, um, the uh, definitive journey talked about that in his last book, the active side of infinity called it the definitive journey, which is the journey beyond death and home. And you you prepare for it while you're still alive. That's what a lot of the mystery schools were doing in Greece and ancient Egypt and India and China. They were they were not just preparing, get, not just getting you used to death. They were preparing you for the journey that would take you away from here and home. And I think now now we're going to be we're getting closer and closer to the biggest opportunity and the system knows it's going to lose some of us but it's okay because it knows what comes into the next simulation it'll have locked in tight yeah <clears throat> and I, I would love to do it and i this would probably be a whole another podcast and i definitely don't want to be locked in tight either and i know that i, I just need to go on my own spiritual journey and, and read a lot of these books and, yeah. and, and again slow things down like i described the monk culture at you know just the processes that they go through are very intense you know from at least from what i've heard in, in some of these places but again that's probably for a whole other one but when you talk about home howdy is there any evidence of what home is it's a feeling i think it's um it's a nostalgia uh richard rose a, um a teacher who died 15 years ago or so is someone i, I still really trusted of, of him being very honest with his work he said that there were three main emotions that we would go through in our life one is a fear that's obvious two is seduction which is just there's something i want and i'm going to figure out how to get it but the most one we usually have as an emotion is nostalgia a, me- a memory of something in our past and what's interesting is true nostalgia like if we think about when we were eight years old it's not just the experience uh, in tr- exactly. We're, we're, we're remembering things, the best parts of that experience. We're remembering sort of like a, a perfected view of that time of our life. It's like we really don't want to go back to when we were 12 because we know it wouldn't really be like our memory is, but it's the possibility of what 12 could have been like that we have this nostalgia for. And I think that's like a it's like a deeper reminder of where we really come from, that that nostalgia for things in our past is really a nostalgia uh, completely for this place I'm calling home, which is outside the matrix, which is outside of Plato's cave. And it's, it's a memory of we, 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 it's like a feeling I have that of course, just like the feeling I might have of 
some hockey team I played for when I was 14 and I forget all the jerks and the problems I had with whoever I just remember the good part of it it's kind of like that with home it's like we have it's like this this memory of this place that's not here and if somebody asked me could you describe it the easiest answer I would give is it's a place where there's no there is no false and there's no deception where there is just clear seeing and that's what it feels like and it it just for whatever reason I think it's um I'm I'm done with this I'm done with this um simulation experience that's be- beautifully said man and I know you talked about it earlier in the podcast and you know, this is it, it, it would interest me to see how that they were able to get into to home this this the demiurge how they were at, to have access to that and bring us into this false this false realm you know what I'm saying that's because because then it could happen again howdy and I don't want that to happen again man right no, and it's, it's so it's all a part of the learning curve. It's all a part of, you know, it's it's about it's not just trying to journey into your own life. I mean, journey, try to journey if you can before you were born. Try to journey into the pre-birth state and see what was that like, and what was it? What was it that was suggested? Here's a physical body for you to come in uh, with these parents and this whatever and this situation and this life script and. What what got us to say, yeah, that's a good idea. I'm going to go do that. You know, that's I think all that is used for someone who can tap into that. That's useful, too. That's use That's valuable because it it's all a part of just gathering knowledge. It's all a part of gathering totality. And it's being comfortable that whatever, you know, whatever I come to the table with, whatever I'm bringing, I know it's just a piece. It's just one jigsaw puzzle piece of a giant jigsaw and a jigsaw puzzle. And, and I know that. I know I don't have complete knowledge of, of things, but I'm just bringing a piece. And hopefully someone else brings another piece and someone else brings another piece. And then that way you fit all of them together. And you, as a group, you figure it out. Oh, that's it. There's the answer. There's the understanding. And uh, I think it's it's valuable that each person goes and finds your own, you go find your own piece. What's the piece you're bringing to the table to help all the rest of us. And it doesn't have to be the piece I'm looking for. It doesn't have to be the piece someone else is looking for. It's the piece that's the piece you're supposed to find. And that's all you have to focus on is what's that piece that you're supposed to look for. Beautifully said, man. Well, uh, <clears throat> as beautiful as always, man. I, I, I Just very eye-opening, just talking to you each and every single time. I'm very blessed to have these conversations with you, man. And I know you're always you're just a very busy man. So again, I'm very greatly appreciative of you joining the show. So where can people find you? Um, when do you plan on releasing your next book? Do you have a website? All those good things. Yeah, actually. So well, I, the YouTube channel is still running, but I, I post now maybe once a month there just to say hi with a few things. But there's, there's still videos that are there, hundreds of videos there. I'm over on Locals now, which is still it's free to join there's a there's a small membership site for a few other or a small subscriber site for other pieces of it which would be great if those of you would like to join that as well and it's a couple of dollars a month and you can be a part of the community it's it's really more for a community where people can kind of get away from the outside and talk privately and share things privately that's really what i set it up for um but i post a lot of the stuff like this interview will go to the locals channel first and then it will eventually wind up on youtube and other places so it's a place to get things first um my website which still for now is is running which is egyptian-wisdom-revealed.com is soon uh, this week shifting over to a new one so i'm going to actually have a new website ready to go and it'll just redirect you to the new one um once that's ready um, so the new website is there. Yeah, so I've got a, a historical book coming out in should be September the 1st that I have a, a new historical book out on the 1800s. <clears throat> uh, not exactly on the World Fairs again, but on something that is would sound on the surface to not be like extremely deep, but turned out to be incredibly deep. And then I have another Exit the Cave book I'm planning to come out with a book, sort of book two in November. And that's, I guess, the overview of where I'm at. You can always find the books, a place like Amazon to start with. You don't have to buy them there. You can just see the information and go where you'd like. And and yeah, I, I'm always I'm grateful for the encouragement and the support. And I, I'm always thankful for the, you know, the people who buy the books or make the donations because it's 
It's extremely valuable. Again, a reminder for Exit the Cave, you can always go to the website too. I have a PDF file. You can buy it cheaply, if you, you know, because books can be a bit expensive and with the shipping and everything else, it can be. So I wanted to make sure something was affordable um, as well. So there's lots of options if, if this stuff interests you. And again, the, the point of it all is, is just, is just to think. It's just to ask questions and be okay with where the thinking takes you. Don't don't force your thinking to have to be the answer you want it to be. Let your thinking take you where the thinking takes you. That would be what I have said. Rock on, man. Well, I'll chat with you here in about six months or so. Okay. There'll be a lot of good stuff to talk about whenever those books release, man. I'm excited and I uh, wish the best on your journey, yeah. Howdy. Thanks. Good to be back again. And, uh, you know, I, I've always thought we've had great conversations. I really think you're doing great stuff on your channel. And I, I just hope it keeps to grow because, um, like I said, I think I think your interviews are really, really well done. Thank you very much, sir. Well, you make it easier for me because I love philosophy and I love these types of conversations. So some some aren't as easy. So I'm just very thankful that, that these are. So appreciate you, my man. You got it. Cheers.